Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Geomologist Presents with Amy as a guest. Hello. And we are now, I think this is the fourth movie that we're going to review, number yeah. four, that we're going to review. And the movie we're going to review today is For a Few Dollars More, or in the original Italian, Per Calce Dollaro in Più. This is a 1965 spaghetti western film directed by Sergio Leone. This is the first of three Sergio Leone films we're going to be reviewing and the first of the movies that we're going to be reviewing that stars Clint Eastwood. And Clint Eastwood is the man with no name. Uh, in this one, he's given the name of Manco, which means one hand. And it also stars... Uh, notably, Lee Van Cleef as uh, Major Mortimer, or is he a general? I can't remember if he's a general or he's colonel. He's a Colonel Douglas Mortimer. And the other main star is Gian Maria Volonte as El Indio, the main bad guy. So, yeah, um, this film is notable in that it is the second part of what is known as the Dollars Trilogy. Interestingly, the Fistful of Dollars, the first one, is not going to be in our top 10, but we did hint that we might do an honorable mention, and maybe it'll make that cut. What do you think, Amy? Perhaps. I mean, we've seen the other two. Might as well watch the first one. I guess right. you could call it the prequel. Right. So, so yeah. So, the interestingly, it was a international co-production between Italy, West Germany, and Spain. I believe it was filmed in those locations. And it was released, like I said, in 1965, but not until 1967 in the U.S. And it it was pretty popular. It had a budget of $600,000, and it made a, in the box office $25.5 million. That's a pretty big box office bonanza for that time. It was distributed by PEA in Italy and by United Artists in the U.S. and U.K. So, um, yeah. Languages, it's in Italian originally, and then the English is overdubbed. I believe there might be a German version as well, but I'm not sure. So, uh, so I, I thought uh, overall it's a good movie. It is 132 minutes which maybe dragged a little bit. So that's, what is that? Uh, two hours and 12 minutes or so. There are definitely things that could have been cut out, some things that are maybe done. Uh, there are some things that we're going to talk about that Sergio Leone tends to do in all of his films, correct, Amy? Oh, yes. And, uh, and of course, notably as well, is the music by Ennio Morricone which has won awards for his music. And I think he won a lifetime achievement for his music. Yes. So, so what are your overall impressions of this first movie we're doing by Sergio Leone? I didn't dislike it. I mean, it was a little disjointed and maybe it wouldn't have been so disjointed if we started with the first one. Right. <laughs> Who knows? But um, I thought it was a fun movie. Thought it was well done, well acted, a little diff. Well, I mean, we're from Texas, so obviously we know that a lot of the places they were talking about were not filmed there. Doesn't look right. exact. No, but, or New Mex or or West, uh, New Mexico, right? It says Texas, New Mexico, the correct. Southwest, right. I mean, we don't live terribly far from the city that they supposedly traveled to, and. I don't want to give too much of the plot away because you haven't gone over it yet. But yeah, we're going to get to that. But I did mm -hmm. forget something very important. What's and that? that? We have we have call-ins or a call-in, a series of call-ins from our uh, man who shot Liberty Valance episode. Ooh, I like call-ins. I like call-ins too. And uh, this call-in is a series of calls from Evil Jeff. I'm going to play them and then we'll respond. So why is Jeff evil? That's just his moniker. I don't. I think he's actually a very good guy. So I don't Evil, think Evil Jeff him. does the podcast Minions and Musings. Um, you can find him on various discords. Link will be in the description. Yeah, we'll put the link in the show notes. So here we go. Yeah. Evil Jeff. 
just finished listening to your review of the man who shot Liberty Valance. Great. Um, I love the review. I uh, love the back and forth between you and Amy. Uh, I actually did see this movie for the first time uh, not that long back. Um, while I have known about the movie for years with my father, my uncle, talking about it, um, you know, especially the song uh, that I had forgotten was not part of the movie. I think I, yeah, after you said it, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. So, but I'd heard a lot about it. I had not seen it and watched it. I didn't see the very beginning. I came in right after, right as the, uh, yeah, right after he had been uh, robbed and then watched all the way through. So I not caught up on the flashback part of it. We just have to pause because flashback was used as a significant. Uh, you wanted me to pause? No, I was trying to explain to our listeners why there was a pause. Oh, because I didn't they... mean to pause. Oh, but go ahead. What were you going to comment on? Oh, when they call and leave messages for us, depending on which platform they use, sometimes it cuts them off after a minute or two minutes, and sometimes it gives them longer, depending on which uh, way they decide to call us. Yeah, I was going to kind of just play straight through, but I think it is notable that uh, Jeff did mention the lack of the title song that was supposed to be in the movie or was commissioned for the movie, but was never added but we did talk at length about the music and i think that's what jeff is get going to get to so which I, I think is great to talk about to have talked about the music uh both in high noon and in liberty valance and then we get to the the amazing music that uh Mor morricone does um for the next three movies uh, i would say a fistful of dollars the music's fantastic it's very evocative uh Maybe we'll talk about that a little more, but for sure in the next two movies we're going to review, uh, it, he ramps it up uh, fantastically. So although there, again, uh, some things we will talk about that were a little um, jarring, I would say, in these Sergio Leone movies. So here, I'm going to continue with Evil Jeff, unless you have another mm -hmm. comment. Back about... to you, Jeff. All right. Device in a movie, or if it had been used previously to that as a I mean, interesting thing to try and look up. I think one thing I would say is different. Oh, I guess he talked about the flashback device uh, that was used. And we did note that in Casablanca, right? They do like a flashback montage back to Paris. Uh, we reviewed that this past Wednesday for Valentine's Day. But uh, I think like this whole idea, like you were saying, Amy, how it's how the whole movie is framed, right? By a flashback. Right, whereas Casablanca, the flashback is to fill in the missing pieces right. that we wouldn't have gotten from the script. Whereas I feel as though the man that shot Liberty Valance said, okay, we're going to start you with the end and then take you back. Yeah, we so start at the end. right? Yeah, I think the whole movie was to be a flashback. So I still think you're correct. That might have been the first one. I don't know. Comment down below and let us know if we're wrong. Right. Okay, Jeff continues. Amy's comment about the music, while, yes, the music was not memorable, I don't think you have to have music in the movie to tell the story. I think music, uh, there's two different things that music's going to do for us. One, it can help tell the story, you know, uh, help draw somebody in, you know, think about the uh, music during The Matrix, during fight scenes, everything. That lent itself so well to the fight scene but i don't think it's always necessary i think that one of the other things music does is help cover up the silence because in some of these sets and things like that we don't need to have uh all the background noise everything or the lack of background noise so that music helps kind of fill that silence so it's not an awkward thing and when you look at the music in Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, it's not really needed to tell a story. It may accentuate it, but it's not helping tell or propel the story overall. I think... I'm going to pause right there and mm -hmm. get some comments from Amy first, and then I have something I'd like to add. 
Well, I mean, I, I appreciate his viewpoint on the music, but for me personally, if I go to a movie and there's not music or there's not the sounds that I'm after, I don't really remember the movie. It is part of the experience for me. And I've watched some of the old movies before they were talkies, the silent movies. And you still had a piano player there because right. that would dictate the mood of the movie. Not telling the story, not necessarily that, but it draws you in and it, it gets you involved in the movie. You feel more like a participant instead of just somebody sitting in a seat. And I mean, that was my biggest criticism about Liberty Valance. It didn't didn't resonate with me because there was no real music after the movie. Right. Yeah. The, the theme song that wasn't there. Yeah. But that's, a I guess, going to be a running joke. But so this reminds me, for example, in Casablanca, mm -hmm. where the music definitely pulls you into and through the movie, especially when Sam is playing, especially La Marseillaise, the, you know, where they, the French uh, expats drown out uh, the Germans mm -hmm. in the, in, in uh, the cafe. Knock and then, on wood. Right. Knock on wood. Right. And then, um, and then amazingly, when the music stops, when there is no music, it's incredibly jarring and it makes you, and it forces you to sort of focus in on what's going on in the action. And, the, and when the music stops, it's when, you know, there's a very important piece of dialogue between um, Rick and Ilsa, or when Rick is just sitting there contemplating, or there's an important line like the gin joint line, right? So there, the music, the absence of music is very jar jarring and draws you into the dialogue that's very important. So, but but I, I thought that's an amazing way that they use music in Casablanca, where at, at least in Amy's opinion, and me, the music to me was not memorable. And then when I learned it's sort of derivative or used in other movies and just retooled, it makes me less enthusiastic about it. So, but it, I mean, so basically, I, I don't know if I, you agree with this, Jeff, if you call back or whatever, or you agree with it or you don't have to. But maybe the music, like you said, wasn't necessary. As I think that's what I interpreted. And it didn't really help or hinder the movie, which is fine. But I guess it doesn't make it as memorable, like a like a a composition, right? So, you know, so when you're watching, for example, an opera or a ballet, it's the music and the performance that's going on. And I think that's what uh, someone like, like the director, like Michael Curtis in Casablanca, and the screenwriters, as, as well as Sergio Leone working with the screenwriters and Enrico Morricone are uh, kind of doing in, in this this trilogy and in the in the Spaghetti Western movies uh, that we're going to review. All right. So Jeff has a little bit more to say. Anything mm -hmm. else, Amy? Oh, no. Sorry, Jeff. We keep cutting you off. <laughs> oh, but he's got really cool stuff. So, you know, we want to he does. I, you, I you wanna, appreciate you know, his, his opinion. Yeah, we do I mean, I'm not saying that he's wrong. I mean, I think every person has their own opinion where music in a movie fits for them. Right. I mean, look how memorable movies like Star Wars, for example, or Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, you, you know these themes, right? Because they're so memorable and they fit with the movie and they're very important um, mm -hmm. to the movie, right? So, all right. Back the to music Jeff. not being a big part of it or so memorable is that John Ford had wanted to tell the story using light and shadow. That's why I chose black and white, had to choose the shadows correctly, where the lighting was going to happen. Um, and by having music be a part of that, I think he would have taken away from the starkness of the black and the white in the movie itself. You know, if you look at some of John Ford's other westerns, there is more music in there that does help really propel the story, makes it feel like it's moving somewhere or giving you a certain feeling. Here, I don't feel that he wanted that. It was telling the story using the light and the shadows. So the music really was there to kind of be a filler, per se. Uh, so we didn't have so much silence and it wasn't totally awkward throughout it. Can you imagine a movie that had no music in there? What would that look like? In fact, I, now I'm going to have to do an internet search of movies that have no music in them whatsoever. 
thanks for the review and i look forward to some of those other westerns as y'all review them all right so thank you so much jeff uh, for those messages and you know i think he's right i mean thinking about other john ford movies that we've watched recently i will say stagecoach for example that you, was you a know, great movie yeah, not on our know, list but a great movie yeah it might be an honorable mention um Maybe we, you, some of you listeners could put in the comments what honorable mention maybe we should review, but uh, that might be a great idea there. Um, but in Stagecoach, the music kind of propels the journey, right? So, so I agree. So John Ford has used music in a very productive way to pr propel the stories in his movies. But I guess in this one, uh, perhaps you're correct, Jeff. You may have nailed it there that he just didn't want that to, it was filler. Like you said, it was filler. Perhaps. There were a lot of scenes in <laughs> Who Shot Liberty Palace that we could have cut right out and put music in, but that's my opinion. Anyways. All right. Thank well, you so much, Jeff, for your comments, though. Yeah, thanks again. And it'd be great if we had more people come and uh, call in and comment. You could do that. We have all the ways to do that in the, uh, the show notes. So let's get to um the cast before we get into the the plot i just before we get into the plot and about the movie i know this movie's been around since 65 so that's almost uh what is that is that 60 well, almost 60 years old this movie um, quite some time they filmed it in 65 and released it in italy in 65 but i right. believe it didn't come to the u.s until a year or two after 67 you know 67 yeah. so um Right. So do you want to talk about some of the cast or we already made the main, the main three, anyone else of note you feel in the cast? There's a lot of people in this movie. There's a oh lot of people. my goodness. There's a ton of them. And I think it's kind of funny because I think as we go through the dollar series, I think yeah. they just kind of are all there just flipping with different people. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So I, I think of note, uh, Klaus Kinski makes an appearance in this movie as wild. And all the all the characters have just crazy evocative names. All the gang members, especially all of El Indio's uh, gang members. Mm -hmm. Mario Brega is Nino, and I think is that the one who? I think Mario Brega is the one who dies in every single of Sergio Leone's movies. So he's just there as a different character, and he always ends up dying. He just always dies. I'm not right. so certain that if my agent was getting me a callback, that I want to mm -hmm. be the one. Do you want to die in this movie? Yeah. Yeah, we have It'll Luigi. Never be more memorable than dying in every one of the Western movies. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I think other notables are that we'll probably mention on and off. Uh, we already sent, said the main ones: Clint Eastwood, Lee Van Cleef, mm -hmm. Jan Maria Volante. But we have Luigi Pistilli as Groggy. Uh, see, they have funny names. It's like the the Seven Dwarves. Aldo Sambrell as Cuchillo, which is knife. Uh, Nino being kid or mm -hmm. boy. Um, so, and then Benito. Stefanelli as Huey, I think. Other, mm -hmm. Everyone else in there is kind of just uh, 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 just playing a part, not really. Oh, and then there's Jose Cana Canalejas. I think he's been in other things. We probably see him off on and off in some westerns as Chico. That's another one. So, um, so other than that, you know, you got a lot of people that just come in and out uh, as as a as a cast a cast a, a big cast of characters. Uh, so. All right. So any oh uh it didn't win any awards, right? Uh I think it was received well here, but I I don't know that it was even up for any Academy Awards. And it it mm, could possibly be because it wasn't filmed in the US because they were trying to get around some of the laws so they could put things in there that shouldn't have been in there. Um and I think Sergio did that quite a few times. Yeah, I mean, while it has gained sort of critical accolade, um, the reviewer aggregate on Rotten Tomatoes is like 92%. Um, it's it's a classic. It's part of this Dollars trilogy. But, it, you know, at the time, I think they really, uh, and I think maybe why they filmed it overseas uh, and away from the kind of codes and statutes that they had for filming in the, in the U.S., they filmed it overseas because they could do a lot of sexual innuendo, a lot of adult situation uh, type themes, and and a lot of violence. There was definitely a lot of violence in this movie. 
and against women and children too. Right, right. So I guess that's a that's a good good idea to bring that up. So there is we will talk, of course, lines and veils, not in any gory detail, but there are extreme adult situations in this movie. Um, it is definitely, I don't know what the rating is. Maybe this was before Hays Code ratings, but it definitely is a rated R plus, I would say, for the things that happen in this movie. So, of course, nothing's graphic, but just the situations are, are pretty are, uh, pretty I triggering, a, I guess, would be. Yeah, I think there's a touch of nudity. Yeah, In today's society, remember. they would probably let it pass as a PG-13, but as a parent, I would not. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. have let my child watch it, not not until they were older, maybe high school age. Yeah, and and, and of course, uh, this is a review of a movie. There are spoilers galore mm -hmm. uh, for the, in this movie. And uh, I, I do like the way, I mean, I say Sergio Leone is great at having these very evocative themes, I think like you had looked up for us, right? He was very much into the, the sort of Japanese cinema, correct? Absolutely. So didn't you mention what, what director he really appreciated and what huh? movie he kind of framed this movie for? But you looked I that up. I can't pronounce his name. Oh, Akira Kurosawa. I think you, you mentioned. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I was like, I know who he is. I can't pronounce his name and I'm going to butcher it. And I don't want to do that. Yeah, so it was very much, I think you had looked up about, you know, what the influences Sergio Leone took. And of course, that people take influence from Sergio Leone after that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so he took inspiration from Akira Kurosawa, especially Yojimbo for this movie. But, uh, you know, it is, it is a, I think at its core, it is a tale about revenge, right? Absolutely. I mean, I took it as one about revenge. Yeah. So, so generally speaking, the movie follows these two bounty hunters, mm -hmm. um, Colonel Douglas Mortimer, played by Lee Van Cleef, and then Manco, who comes in a little later. And uh, they're these two bounty hunters, and they 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 want to get this bounty on this notorious uh, Mexican bandit named Indio. Uh, but it starts out with a Lee Van Cleef doing a job where he confronts, uh, riot, rides his horse to a town's brothel, stops the train illegally, uh, shoots down a criminal, uh, and it's a it's a really it's a great scene, you know, how he chases this guy down um, and, you know, into this guy's home, right? And, mm -hmm. then, he, and then he collects a bounty. But what's interesting, he doesn't, uh, does he, I think he shoots one of the, no, that's in a different movie. Ha, I can't get these confused. That's in a different movie. I believe Be he sat down to have a plate of food with him. No, I think that was in, that was in the other movie. Goodness. <laughs> Okay, yep. so the whole Dollars trilogy is like running through my head right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but he collects his bounty on this uh, this guy, easily kills him from a, from a distance. Uh, he chases a guy out of the brothel. This guy, uh, Guy Calloway, played by Jose Terron. Um, so there are a lot of Italian and Spanish actors in this. So, um, so then he goes, collects a bounty, and then he's told, He's looking for another bounty, and then he's told that this guy, uh, Manco, has collected a bounty on him. And then we first see Clint Eastwood ride into town to track uh, Kavanaugh at a saloon. This guy, uh, Kavanaugh, a baby cab, red baby Kavanaugh, played by Jose Marco. And then Clint Eastwood, Manco, rides into town, into the saloon. Guy's playing five card draw, and then we see like the quick draw of Clint Eastwood, right? The right, Amy. What do you? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's realistic? I mean, I don't know. We watch a lot of Western stuff and we see a lot of period stuff. Pretty certain that, I mean, you had to be a quick draw in the Old West. So I, I don't discount that they could draw quickly, but the number of rounds that they're firing doesn't exactly equate to the cartridge that would be in that gun. Yeah, I think that's true, right? So and they do. Cinema. Yeah, it is cinema. And, uh, and, and I guess what's interesting is like, uh, westerns both pre-spaghetti western um and the spaghetti westerns on right there is this uh i mean i think the more modern westerns tend to be a little more realistic on how guns and things work but back then uh not so much and the the whole thing is right there weren't very many of these shootouts or you know one-on-one -on -one fights in the old west right so Correct. And even the one, even the most notable one took place. I mean, I guess it's 
it's not to me it's not wild west it's more like sort of west in dodge city mm -hmm. uh, with wild bill hickok where he you know bought a guy one-on-one -on -one in the street right so um, but he only did that once maybe twice in his yeah. entire career but it makes it sound like every western town you go into people are shooting everybody out in the streets and they're standing yeah, there's a duel a right feet apart and I mean, it's it's comical and it's entertaining in a movie, but I don't think it's very realistic. Yeah, yeah. Realistically, most people were shot in the back while mm -hmm. they were drunk and running, or at range with the rifle. So, or because yeah. they didn't pay their tab at the brothel. Right. Yeah. So anyway, so they switch scenes after we introduce uh, Mortimer and Manko, and we, they switch scenes to the jailbreak. I thought that was a really cool, like you know almost like war movie type of scene, the jailbreak by Indio. That and, was very fun. And then it shows how ruthless though Indio is. Um, he, he only spares one guy's life, kills everyone. Uh, I guess he, he might, he had a bunk mate who had him onto like some sort of treasure. Right. So already you can see like the, uh, the kind of adventure story that's building here. Right. The uh, Indio had a cellmate who knew about some sort of, uh, bank treasure and how to get to it and he designed the vault and everything um, mm -hmm. and that's why Indio like takes all this intel out and then uh, the next scene is kind of one of the most more troubling scenes and it still stays with Indio and it shows that he's a ruthless intelligent but very twisted individual um, and that's when he goes and tracks down the person who put him in, in jail right or worked for him that part I didn't 100% get, but I think he might have been someone that worked for him and then turned, maybe yeah. like a spy idea. Like a turncoat, I think. Yeah. And then he 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 kills this man, and then he off off camera, uh, you you know that his his wife and child are killed, and that's when we first get that little pocket watch. Oh my goodness, Sergio! <laughs> that pocket watch, it, it it's like singing it's a small world it just never stops once you hear it. right yeah and then yeah. this whole like trope when the chimes finish begin and that's like supposed to be when you you sh you know you draw your gun and stuff and and then that's the other we get a little background into him and then we we learn um that he is a really bad dude and apparently this whole pocket watch thing started um, when he, when he, you know, he killed, he killed somebody and then you say it was uh, Indigo's sister or wife. I never did figure that out. I think it was his. No, no, it was, it, it, we'll, we'll get to that at the end. So, so basically he goes, he has his flashback. He drifts and he, he kind of clearly he's a, is very, he, he does drugs and he has his flashback and, um, the watch originates from a young woman, um, played by Rosemary Dexter, who killed herself while India was sexually assaulting her. And he had found her and her lover, and he killed him first. And then the watch has the photo of the woman and was presented as a gift by the young man before they were killed. Um, so it seems like he's consumed by guilt, but he's not remorseful. I don't believe he's remorseful. I think he was like any other psychopath. He kept a trophy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, kind of. I mean, he does strike me as this kind of serial killer, kind of, kind of vibe, you know, a sort of noir-ish serial killer, uh, pretty evil type of vibe, mm -hmm. right? So, so anyway, there's a manhunt on for this dude, and the reward is huge. So Manco arrives in El Paso, and he crosses paths with Mortimer, and both believe that India will rob the town's bank. Can Which I interrupt contain... you for just a quick second? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a great you said thing El Paso. Yeah. And even though Sergio had never been there, he had his set directors go and recreate from, I believe, pictures from the 1870s El Paso. Right. And let me share this. Okay. And it almost exact. Right yeah, it's really a colors. fascinatingly and... close. I was like, is El Paso that small? It was. It, it was only a population of 186 people, and any everybody in El Paso except for 23 people were of Hispanic origin. Right. So, but I mean, this, this is a perfect, almost recreation of the hotel you see in the background, 
the three-story hotel that's in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, the bank, I mean, the bank, I think, is a little bit off camera. No, the bank is that white building to the left, I believe, right? To the or left, like uh-huh. Yeah, so uh, it's pretty amazing uh, recreation, right? So, um, yeah, so the the two bounty hunters, that's that's pretty cool. I'm glad we found that little tidbit because we were like, is El Paso really that small? What is this? Is this how accurate is this? And wow, it's pretty. Well, we, we had to go look it up and then it's like, wait a second. <laughs> how did we not know this? <laughs> we live right. close. Yeah. So so Mortimer and Manco cross paths and they believe that, like I said, Indio's gang is going to steal this this bank, you know, the town, rob the bank. Um so there's confirmed when one of India's men arrives to stake out the town and they goad him. Um, they goad him. This is the hunchback wild played by Klaus Kinski into a fight, but he, you know, he keeps cool relatively speaking. And then they found, they find out that the other is a bounty hunter and are chasing the same purpose. So, um, right. So they team up. Yeah. They team up eventually. There's this little kind of cool thing with shooting, um, shooting gun skills, shooting the Colonel's hat and stuff like that. But Which again, um, very fanciful, but yeah. way too many bullets for a revolver. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, they so were they, not that accurate and they would jam. Yeah. So it seems like Mortimer is sort of the brains of this operation in a way, and he convinces Manko to go undercover. Um, so he rescues uh one of India's friends from prison and he gets to the gang. And then, like, really, there's a lot of tense moments where some people don't trust him. Like, why are you bring this guy in? Blah blah blah. So then he sends uh, Manko off to another bank, like to act as like a, a distraction while they rob the bank of El Paso. So so <laughs> Manko just like kills these dudes, pretty pretty ruthlessly, right? Like while they're in their bedroll still. So so you know these bounty hunters aren't aren't angels, you know? No, they're not. And I think that's one of the cool things here is is a it's kind of a it's almost like a switch, I think. Um, and I think it's kind of neat that we do see that um uh hint hint or foreshadowing. We see this kind of idea of sort of a like an anti-hero in a way, right? A little bit. Yeah, because these guys are 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 violent men, Manko and Mor and Mortimer are violent men. And Absolutely. Feel like, and and Indio is just another you know, a, a, a darker shade of of a bad, I guess. But uh, no, these are he. I think he represented a larger um, fee paid for their services, and yeah. he's just a hit. Right, right, yeah. Because they're like, oh, if we can stop them robbing the bank, we can get this money and get the bounty, right? So, right. right. Well, so and the, what, the I funny... thought was, what I thought was interesting is when Menko was sent to rob the other bank as the decoy. Yeah. They actually didn't. They just went into the to the station master and had him put out a message that the bank had been robbed so that he could ride all the way back to El Paso to be there to shoot up the streets. And right. ironically, it's the same path and the same mountains in all three movies. I know. They film in the same location. Mm -hmm. Right. So Manko actually actually he kills these guys and then he goes and gets the sheriff. I uh, goes to Santa Cruz to order to be a decoy, right? He says that the bank's robbed. And then all the sheriff from El Paso that's guarding the bank, they take off, right? The bank in El Paso. So uh so Manko kills the man he sent with, sets up a false telegraphic alarm with the decoy instead of you know doing what the original plan was. And then he arrives in El Paso to bring Indio down with Mortimer, but it goes totally wrong because the gang sort of like outwits him, right? They blow up the back of the bank and take the money. So Which, yeah, I was I was like, wow, okay, the movie is a lot longer than I expected. I'm like, oh, they're gonna they're gonna get them, you know, while they're in the bank and stuff. But nope, keeps going. <laughs> Just keeps going and going, and no intermission. Yeah, no intermission. So then the the gang like the uh, so they I guess they're like, oh well, it didn't it didn't work. So they kind of sever their ties. But then and the gang goes to Agua Caliente to you know to kind of wait out the heat from robbing the bank. Uh, but then Manko and Mortimer. Um, I think they get caught there, don't they? No, no. Manko joins back up with Indio and he says, oh, yeah, the other guys got caught and shot. I guess the decoy worked. Oh, you got the money. Great. Oh, that's right. He shot himself. Yeah. Oh, he shot himself. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, and then uh, he convinces 
uh, Indio to go one way, but not in the direction the colonel originally told them to. But then when they get to Agua Caliente, Mortimer is there. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then the hunchback recognizes the colonel from the previous encounter, forces a showdown, and then Tuskinski exit stage, Pine Box, and his his character is killed by the colonel. That's and then, uh, but then the colonel convinces Indio to keep him alive because he can open the safe because they got the safe, but they don't have no way to open it, and they don't want to blow it up because then it would destroy all the money, right? So. <laughs> Yeah, typical typical adventure or a dilemma, right? You have this chest, you can't, you don't have a, you don't have a, a rogue or a, sorry, a thief. Let's use a, a old school terms. You don't have a thief to pick the lock, um, so you gotta, right? You gotta blow it up. But uh, a, a, the colonel convinces Indio that he can open it, and either he has a combination or is really good at that sort of safe cracking thing. I think, right? He cracks a safe, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he cracked the safe. He shot it, didn't he? No, I thought he cracked this, like cracked the safe. But he, they don't use it. He basically doesn't use explosives. Yeah. And India says we're we're going to wait it out here for a month, let the fear die over the bank robbery, and then we'll take the money and, and go right, go to Mexico. I think was where they wanted to go. Well, that so was the theory. Yeah. So yeah, Manco and the Colonel team back up. Do you think this is like a good like? Is it like more like a buddy cop or just like a? Adventures of convenience. How do you feel their, their relationship? Um, at this point in the movie, I was thinking that they were just teaming up because it's easier to work together and they won't both die. Yeah. But yeah. at the end of the movie, my my whole viewpoint on that changed to being more like, okay, this is what I would consider more like either good friends or even like an uncle to a nephew type of relationship. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty I, I mean, the ending to me was, was fantastic. Probably the best part of the movie, not just because it ended after two hours and 12 minutes, but <laughs> I was ready after the watch for it to end. <laughs> I know that watch. I hate repetitive <laughs> noises in the tick, 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 tick. Yeah. The ding, 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 ding. Yep. And then uh, I thought it was over and we we're going to get to the fight and he opens another watch. <laughs> Yeah. just wanted to mute the yeah. TV. Yeah, we're jumping on ahead. Suffice it to say, Manco Sorry. and the Colonel. Yeah, Manco and the Colonel like plan to steal the bank money. The Colonel had taken the money out of the chest earlier. He locks it up. They hide it. Um, but then they get caught. They get beat up. And then there's this whole weird convoluted plot where India says, oh, uh, let's pretend that someone let him go. Let him, let's pretend this guy let him go. And then we'll kill him and we'll whittle. Hey, Nino, we'll whittle down all these guys. Um, and then we, you and I just keep the money. But uh, one guy, Groggy, uh, realizes this. And then there's becomes a shootout, running shootout, as Manko and the Colonel kind of get away because they, they are actually released. Because <laughs> Indio tells the guy to release him. Um, mm -hmm. And then he kills a guy, Cuchillo. And then uh, he tells the gang to search for them. There's this running and gun that I think went way over long. You know, they could just have one, you know, kind of series of fighting and shooting instead of going from house to house and fighting and shooting. Uh, but I, get, I feel like that was typical of the, even when I watch war movies of the time, you know, like the, uh, the Red Devils or something like that, or, or the Green Berets, they have the like house shooting move and then shoot another scene and shoot some more rat, tat, tat, tat. You know, they just like to show instead of like just one, continuous fight scene right it's like a series of little fight scenes that's what ends up happening when you I mean, pay that much for a movie set you got to use it yeah i guess so but the funny thing is when groggy figures out what's going on he kills nino um and then they force india to open the chest it's empty and then they're like ah oh, those bounty hunters got the money and he goes groggy you got to help me <laughs> even though he and joe's like he totally betrays his own dudes like I would have just, I'd be like, I think I'm out of here at this point. But anyway, one by one, Manco and Mortimer take down the gang in the streets, and then Mortimer shoots Groggy, mm -hmm. who then takes a, who then uh, and then Indio takes a out of his pocket watch and begins to play it to start. So it's just now Mortimer and uh, Mortimer and Indio, mm -hmm. and then he shoots the gun out of Mortimer's hand. Indio does. And he starts playing the uh, the music, the pocket watch, and um, 
Well, I thought he threw him a gun and told him, yeah, pick it pick up, it yeah. up. And when the watch stopped playing, then they could fire on each other. Right, right. But Manko has different ideas. Clint Eastwood's character has different ideas, right? Mm-hmm. He does. He comes out from behind just when the pocket watch was going to end. Yep. And then I, I was about to lose my mind from that. And he opens up the pocket watch, another one of them with the same song. Yep. And he gives his gun belt and pistol to Mortimer to even the odds. And he points, mm-hmm. keeps his Henry pointed at India. And then he says, now we start. And that's, I think Sergio Leone does this like one-on-one duel, like the best. Right. Um, but I think... I think he said, I think he had Manco do this because Manco realized, because it was um, Mortimer's watch that um, I believe Manco had. Yeah. Manco took it. like, And when he it from opened his... it and he saw the picture, he's like, oh my God, this is his sister. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. It's his sister in the uh, American version. It's his daughter in the Spanish version. Correct. Which is interesting. Um, or Spanish Italian version. Anyway, so during the standoff, Manko looks down at the pocket wash, sees a picture of the woman that uh, India had assaulted, and then and then they uh, they do the duel. And again, it, it's just I love the framing. It's like the circle, you know, the circle of the arena, right? The way that the Thing is positioned in the, the the sort of quote unquote town square circle, and then it's just the music ticking down, the pocket watch ticking down, and then they draw when the music ends, and and Mortimer shoots him, guns him down, guns him down. But I thought the part that was coolest is that Mortimer is like, no, all I wanted was my revenge, so the money's all yours. Yep. And Manco was putting all the bodies into the wagon. He's counting, he's like, oh my God, I'm short. So then he turns around and finds the one that he's missing. Yeah, he finds Groggy, who was trying to wait in ambush, and he takes him out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then he's riding out of town, and there's the bag of the money from the bank heist. (laughs) Yep, and all the lifeless bodies. And that's it. Yeah, so I I really enjoyed this movie. The first or the first of our, like I said, of three Sergio Leone movies that we will be reviewing. Mm-hmm. More or less back to back. You could probably, if you just look at the timeline, we're doing them in a chronological order, so you could, you know, figure those out really. And like mm-hmm. I said, we didn't do the first one. Um, oops. See, this is for a few dollars more. I did the wrong. You told Amy, you didn't tell me I did the wrong background. No, ah. we just were. It's fine. That's a fine background because it's the dollars trilogy. Yeah, we're so, just giving a, a hint to the movie that we didn't watch. Oh my gosh, how funny! <laughs> how funny! Wow, how funny! I went through the whole thing, and we were doing. I had the wrong thing for a few dollars, but we talked about the right movie. That's a good thing. That's the important thing. We talked about the right movie. We were just giving a homage to the other movie. Right, right. It's still Clint Eastwood. I mean. I mean, he looks so young in these movies. I know. I'm like, wow. Compared to another movie. Compared to another movie we're gonna do with him in it. So further on. But uh yeah, so I guess now this is where we talk about what game you'd use. I mean any Western. Well, obviously any Western realistic West, you know, a realistic West. Although I feel like it's I mean, you could do I feel like because of the heroic like the I was gonna say because it's it's very fanciful. What about Savage Worlds Deadlands? Yeah. yeah. Well, I would get, take out the weird stuff with the Deadlands, but you could just do like Savage World, a Savage Worlds core core book set in a Western time period without the weird stuff, mm-hmm. and that would totally work, right? Because you have you have a lot of guys who get get taken down with one shot, and then you have people like uh, Mortimer and Manco, and then Indio, who are uh, and maybe a couple of the gang members who are you know, have some staying power and are more like wild cards and stuff. So, but you got a lot of extras, a few wild cards, you got a, a duel set up and there's actually in the deadlands, there's a way to do a duel too. So, so that, that's kind of great for that. I mean, I know another, another, you know, any Western would really work boot Hill uh, notably, and then uh, aces and eights. But uh, I think since I'm, for me personally, I'm familiar with savage world, right. And I like the duel mechanic in deadlands. That would really be cool. Cause it's got a, it's got a build up too, you know, Oh yeah. Even... What, what about I'll throw this out there, but what about using the same system that we use for like The Walking Dead? Um, I don't 
because it's got the threat meter with the zombies. So you could have a threat meter coming as he's coming down the mountain and trying to rob the bank. And I mean, it's Walking Dead's a pretty deadly game. Yeah, yeah. But I think what's what's neat about Savage Worlds, I, I think that could work. But again, it's like de- it's pretty deadly, you know, these games. So mm-hmm. Walking Dead. And then I, I think it kind of it is definitely more a realist, quote unquote, realistic, right? That any free league uh, meet in year zero type engine game is more realistic in that, you know, you're not necessarily a big damn hero. But I feel like these guys are big damn heroes, you know, they um, are. Right. And then I think it's really interesting, too, because you could even in the dual mechanic, there's like a three round build up. Right. Mm-hmm. And then um, you could even have them roll their like spirit, you know, to see if they're in this particular case, roll their spirit to see if they're distracted by the noise, you know. Mm-hmm. So like Manko is like a- acting like the other player, the other player characters as part of the duel. And yeah. he's not in the duel, but he's causing the distraction you know, encouraging his companion, you know, to help to give him bonuses for the duel, making the bad guy more, more vulnerable. I mean, I, I like that idea. Yeah. I'm trying to think if Call of Cthulhu would work. Not certain on that one. Um, I don't know that it's fanciful enough to go into some of the other ones like, um, like even AD and D, I mean, I I guess it could be a dungeon crawl, but I'm not so certain that D and D and AD and D would work. Maybe fifth edition D and D. Yeah, I mean, fifth edition has did add like guns and gun mechanic, and you could you could find that or import that or convert it. Like boot, there's a conversion in the Dungeon Master's Guide for AD and D first edition from Boot Hill, and you could do that. But uh, and five E could work. I feel like. I feel like there is probably a 5e um westernish hack somewhere. Because then uh, you, you could have your rogue. Yeah, then you could yeah, then you could <laughs> have uh, Mortimer, Mortimer or took some thief or yeah, Mortimer took and, some rogue levels, right? So and you're not climbing out the roof and get caught. You know, right. you have your cloak of invisibility there. You're stealth, you stealth around. They did yeah, you know, this could actually be a cool, I mean, it's a cool heist flick too. Um, and you have people who are pursuing, you, you could really, you could frame it, you know, it didn't have to have necessarily guns. You could frame an AD&D adventure, you know, kind of along these lines. Um, but I, I honestly think Savage Worlds were the best, truth be told, for me. I would agree. Okay. I And got any other comments or that you might have or observations from this movie? No, I think we hit most of them. I just think it, it. I'm I'm still blown away that when we watch the movie, we're like, El Paso didn't look like that. And we hit pause on the movie and we look it up and it was identical. That was a little crazy, but. I mean, it, it it's pretty amazing the effort they put into it to make it feel so real. Yeah. And the downtown was very real. Inside the buildings, very real. Outside in the terrain, not so real. Right. El Paso does not have mountains like that. Yeah, we see that same sort of stepped mountain that they ride through in so many of these movies. But I guess they're all filmed out there on location. I think mm-hmm. it's in Spain. I think so. All right, I well. I, I thought I had the name of it, but I, I don't remember, so. I won't even play like I did. Right. Okay. Well, thank you all for listening. I hope you've enjoyed our uh, fistful of dollars slash for a few dollars more review. Oh my gosh. I can't believe I did that. That's I'm pretty okay. embarrassed. Oh, well, at least Amy had the right picture. I think of Manco. It, that's from the movie. Okay. That's cool. Um, yeah. I mean, he wears that cloak in all the movies. I think this one is actually clean. It's not clean in every one of the movies. No, no. All right. So I think our next one is actually going to be, you guessed it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yes. So we'll get to that one. That one also another long movie. Oh, but yes. I think I, but... I would like to mention really quickly if our viewers would like to watch the movie and they have a subscription oh, right. to Max, it is available for you to watch on Max. 
Is the whole Dollar Trilogy on Max? I think so. I mean, okay. that's where we watched it. But I mean, you you could also try like Pluto or, you know, some of the others like Crackle, things yeah. along that line. Randomly, mm -hmm. they'll have the movies or just I think it's two ninety nine or three ninety nine something like that to watch it on Amazon. Yeah. Okay. So until next time, uh, thank you so much for listening. Good night. And good rolling.